right? As long as we see misfire happen two trips in a row, we'll still get a check engine light on here. And then finally, if the misfire, misfire is bad enough, we will get, there we go, man. We will get the flashing check engine light, which uh, Peterson was always great on this. He always said that should just say $2,500. And maybe then the customer would take their foot out of the throttle and bring it in to get you guys to look at it. Because if that's flashing, we have possible catalyst damaging misfire. Okay, that's the only reason that check engine light will flash is for catalyst damaging this fire. Okay, there's no other reason for it to flash. All right, go ahead, Tim. So, um, I'm gonna talk about this real quick. If you're taking an ASE test or you're doing some sort of online class, this is probably the only time you really need to know this. Type A misfire versus type B misfire, right? Um, you see what the first line says? Type A is severe enough to damage the catalytic converter. That is a separate misfire. We're going to flash the light. Type B um, is everything else. So you'll see places where they reference type A versus type B. It's really, is it catalyst damaging or is it not? All right, misfire data list. This thing uh, has been very confusing throughout the years, and I'm going to show you pretty quick why you guys have had tons of problems with this data list for years. If you look at the ignition trigger right up here, that ignition trigger is ticking away counting those speed up events of the crank. However, it only works at idle, or we should say really low load. As soon as you put your foot into the throttle, as soon as you open that throttle up, get some load, that trigger counter is going to stop counting. And if that trigger counter stops counting, that means my misfire counters are going to stop working. And of course, most of the time, what do you need to do to get this thing to misfire? You got to get your foot in the throttle, drive it, load it, right? So these things always are trouble seeing this thing happen. So we're going to show you some ways that you can figure this out without relying just on this part of the data list. All right, um, misfire RPM and load. These are really simple. If there are numbers in here, there's a code. These will read zero until we set a code. So if I got numbers in here, I got a code. Um, it's kind of like a freeze frame data in there. That shows you the RPM and the load that it was missing at. Now misfire margin, I'm gonna talk a little more about this in a minute. Misfire margin can be helpful sometimes this is weird. This is, see out here, the chance it won't misfire. You guys have been with Toyota long enough. You know how we like these weird negatives? You know, you turn fuel cut on, so when cut's on, it's off, that, that type of thing. Misfire margin is exactly that. If there is a negative value, it is misfiring. If it's a positive value, it's probably not misfiring, and I'll explain a little more about that in a minute. So in this example, this thing's got 100%, it's definitely misfiring. And then the bottom ones, um, middle 2000s, these things can be really helpful, these uh, OTM FFCs. I'm seeing on the 18s and up, we really don't use these as much anymore. But basically, what this stands for, you see it out here, Catalyst over temperature misfire fuel cut. So if we see misfire bad enough, all the way down here on number four, this is the double negative again, we have turned on the fuel cut on that cylinder. So if it says on, guess what that means about the fuel injector? It's off. So we have shut off that cylinder. Now here's the tricky part. If the computer shut off the cylinder, how bad a misfire are we going to see right up here? It's a dead hole now, but I'm not necessarily looking for a problem that's a dead hole, right? The computer has made it a dead hole by shutting the injector off. So that's good to know. It may appear like a worse problem than it really is. All right. Um, misfire data list. This always gets us. I know what RPM and what load value my misfire is happening at. But does anybody know what grams per rev means? 
kind of a fictitious question. I, I, I can't give you what 0.42 grams per rev means. But if I look at my freeze frame, notice my freeze frame is going to give me calculated load right up here. So I can now duplicate this by trying to duplicate the calculated load. I, I can't duplicate 0.42 grams per rev because I don't ever see that. But I can duplicate 35% calculated load at idle and then try to see if I can duplicate my misfire. Okay, so that's another weird thing about that data list that just makes it tough. All right, misfire margin. Let me give you the quick version of this. Every time the cylinder fires, I get this predicted crank increase, right? My crankshaft should speed up a little bit because I get a power pulse. If the crank does not speed up as much as it thought, I'm not going to get 100%. I'm going to get a 40, 60% misfire margin. But it's still positive. I'm still firing the cylinder. It's just not contributing as much. But if it doesn't contribute at all, this big red line down here, if I actually lose RPM, that would be a negative number, and that means I am misfiring. I'm not contributing at all. So that misfire margin, anytime you see a negative number, that means the computer sees that thing misfiring. And I say it that way particularly because just because the computer says it's misfiring doesn't always mean it's actually misfiring, right? It's seeing something happen with that crankshaft that it thinks it's misfiring. But if misfire margin is negative, computer thinks it's misfiring. And it's probably going to shut some cylinders down. All right. Good. We're getting to this slide. Because I must admit, this is weird to talk to you guys. I can see you guys. But I'm used to asking you questions and having you respond. So here's the deal. Single cylinder misfire. If we look down here, I've got one cylinder number four. It's got a lot of misfire. 78 misfire counts. Back here. My misfire margin, minus 120%. It is definitely missing. Notice it was missing at idle, Six, 675 RPM at a fairly low load. Okay? If you guys had something like this, what do you think? See if you guys can type this in the chat box for me. What do you think is going to cause this? What are some basic things that will cause a single cylinder to misfire? What have you guys seen? Give me a couple of, a couple of options here. Oh yeah, I need to chat this in. All right, cool. So injector, absolutely. Injector. Everybody seems to like the injector. Okay. Coil. IGT coil. Good. Good. Leaking injector. Okay, good. Valve, yeah, there's, there's a good one. Nowadays, we got a little more uh, valve and uh, valve spring stuff included. Okay, all right, so I broke these down on our slide here into electrical and mechanical. So everybody goes to the electrical. I think that is probably the more common thing. So we can have a, a coil, a spark plug. Who, you guys replace spark plugs anymore? Do we ever have to do that anymore? <laughs> it's like AF sensors go in way more than spark plugs, don't they? Um, so coil plug, injector, wiring, don't forget that. We've been bit quite a few times where guys have swapped stuff around and the problem doesn't change cylinders and they think, oh, it's mechanical when actually it's a, it's a wiring issue for that injector or that coil. All right, the other side, mechanical, compression, anything that's going to affect compression. And more recently, uh, valve springs, rocker arms, spitting a rocker arm off on one of our cars under load, you'll get single cylinder misfire, right? Uh, broken valve spring, cracked valve spring. Um, we got Christian on there, the, the Lexus, uh, you know, wannabe here. Well, I can see he's not just wannabe. But um, Lexus did a lot of valve spring recalls. We did a few of them, right? And then um, debris, this is a weird one. Every now and then we've seen some uh, spare nuts or, uh, or debris in an intake manifold that'll hold a valve open. 
And uh, what's weird about it is it holds it open for a little bit, then it spits out of the valve, floats around, may get to another cylinder. So anything like that, you're seeing single, single cylinders on there. All right, obviously if we've moved stuff around and it's not electrical, we may need to do a compression test. All right, leak down test, compression, figure out what's going on in the, in the hole. Now, I don't know how much you guys have played with this, but we have an active test. Check the cylinder compression. It's actually on the worksheet. I'm gonna see if you guys get a chance to do this. If you guys have not, well, I should, you guys that are on there, I can see, raise your hand. Has anybody done this active test? Okay, one or two, okay. It's a little clunky. It's a little clunky, so I, I want you guys to try it. So it's on the, um, the worksheet. You have to pull up this special data list and you're looking at relative compression. If I have one cylinder that's going faster than the rest, what does that mean about the compression in that cylinder? It's lower, right? The starter is easier to push it. So in this example, I'd look at cylinder number six. I don't know what the compression is, but I know it's worse than the rest of these. It's nice, it's quick, it's, it doesn't take long to do that active test. So I'm gonna see if you guys get a chance to play with it, get it to work. All right, multiple cylinder misfires. Down here, you notice we've got number two, number four. I don't have anything on number six, but I got two on the same bank. That's highly suspect. And you see back here, my misfire margin, we've got some pretty good misfire happening. It's not 100%, but it's definitely missing. So if I got both banks, I think this is the easy one. Fuel, right? If it's everything, it's going to be fuel, right? Um, water in the fuel, something blocking airflow, some sort of problem there. Um, maybe a, uh, an EFI sensor that covers the whole engine. Mass airflow, coolant temp, things running too rich, something like that. One bank... Um, AF sensor, jump right there, right? AF sensor forcing it to run rich or lean is going to do it. Uh, vacuum exhaust leak. We've had some stories of uh, exhaust manifolds getting hit by road debris, warps the flange, and now we're misfeeding our AF sensor. Uh, variable valve timing. Any guys remember old um, uh, 1MZ, uh, 1MZ uh, V6s when you put the timing belt on wrong and you got the back bank out of time? And uh, it would run, but you'd get misfire on that, that back bank because the timing was off. And then the last one here that's kind of weird, this is an odd one that I wish we could have you in the training center to put a bug in and show you. This exact data list right here is a problem with cylinder number six injector. Now guys look at this and go, there's zero misfire on cylinder six. How can that be the problem? Well, if this injector is so bad that the fuel trims corrected for it, they've now made these two cylinders too lean. Does that make sense? And we've seen this now and then where what normally happens, the guys go in and you end up replacing an injector or coils and eventually you replace everything on that bank and it fixes it and everybody goes, it's done, it's fixed, I don't care what did it, I just wanted to get out of here. Um, but we have seen this. Uh, the quick fix for this, or, or diagnostic fix, go into the injector volume active test, drive the engine rich. Does the misfire get better or worse? Drive it lean. Does it get better or worse? You could go in and actually drive this bank to lean, and you will see this cylinder will start um, missing, and these others will get better. So using that active test and see how the misfire is affected can help a lot. Um, that's, that's caught some guys, caught us too. It's, it's been kind of weird to see because you're thinking, well, number six has got to be the good cylinder. All right, um, IGF, fail safe. Um, we're taking IGF off of most of our coils now, but this has been around. If you guys don't remember IGF, the easy way to remember this, ignition trigger, and I got fire. Computer asks the coil to fire with the trigger. The coil tells the computer it worked. If the computer doesn't see anything on IGF, 
it shuts the injector off on that cylinder, shuts that cylinder down. This will drive you nuts because it has spark, but it's got no fuel. So nobody thinks it's a spark problem. But I think you guys have run into quite a couple of years ago, we had RAV4s that one coil would go bad and the whole engine wouldn't start. Because if you notice, these IGF signals are tied together. So guys would have to swap coil from coil from coil. Um, just remember IGF, there's still quite a few of them out there that have that, but we are taking that off of the newer, the A25A engines don't have an IGF anymore. All right, now the cool one, there's actually a, um, a video I did on this on our invite YouTube channel, which I'm going to send you guys the link to. Um, if you go into the monitor screen, this misfire monitor, I got to back up here, right here, the details of this misfire monitor don't rely on the idle, the being load, no load. This is real-time misfire um, recording. The only problem with it is when you enter this screen, it's a snapshot of that real-time information. So you got to keep backing out and coming back in if things change. But the cool thing about this, it is constantly monitoring misfire. We do two weird things. We do EWMA and rate. Let's make it easy. EWMA is history, rate is current. So this vehicle right now has a little bit of history misfire and it's got a lot of misfire that's happening right now. Okay, let me show you a better example here. So here I got a vehicle that had a misfire on cylinder two. I knew it was on cylinder two. I swapped the coils from two to three, went into my monitor screen and here's what I got. EWMA, history, right, right here. EWMA, I had misfire on cylinder number two. But look at the rate for cylinder number two right now. Is it missing on two right now? Nope. I pulled the coil out of two and I put it in three. Look at cylinder three. Had no misfire before, it's got it now. So I just proved to myself that that coil I swapped was the problem. Okay, this works great. This is so much better than using that misfire data list. You just got to remember where it is in that monitor screen. All right, let's do one more example here. So same thing, misfire on cylinder number two. I swapped the coil from two to three and here's the results I got. I had misfire on cylinder two and I still have misfire on cylinder two. Did anything happen to three? So that coil I just swapped, that wasn't a problem. I gotta go back and figure out what it is about two that's still making it miss. Okay, if you guys can remember where this is in that misfire monitor, this is pretty powerful. This works really well. All right, what kind of time we got, Dale? You are past the schedule for now. Okay. All right, so um, ignition timing control. This is, this is helpful with misfire. Um, we've always wanted to be able to give you guys some information about these two data parameters. So I kind of threw it in here. It's not 100% misfire, but it'll help you with it. So real basic, here's how Toyota does our timing. We have a max limit and a minimum, max retard, maximum advance that the engineer programmed into the car. It'll never go out of that range. But when the car's running, it will actually advance the ignition timing until it sees it knock, then pull that timing away and say, okay, there's my proper ignition timing. And then within a couple of ignition events, it goes back and advances the timing again until it knocks and then pulls it back down again. So basically what we're doing, we're trying to get you right to that perfect ignition timing right before it knocks. This is why Toyota's always gotten pretty decent power and gas mileage out of our vehicles. Not all manufacturers do this, but we're constantly doing it. It's also why you may have run into some of those, it seems like Sienna's especially, that no matter what you do, it knocks a little bit when the customer drives it, right? You may change fuel, you may change all kinds of stuff, decarbon it. It just always has a little bit of knock. Well, if this is what it's doing, no wonder it always knocks. We're always pushing it right until it knock 
and then back in the timing off. That's hard to explain to a customer, but sometimes we need to say that, hey, as long as it's not knocking constantly, then uh, we're, uh, we're okay. All right? So on the data list, there is a knock correct learn value and a knock feedback value. Now, the easiest way to explain this, hopefully you guys are pretty good on fuel trims. Knock feedback is short-term fuel trim, right? This is short-term. This is how much I have to pull the timing back until the knocking stops. Knock correct learn value is long-term. That's how much I'm trying to push into the timing to get it to work right. Okay, so let me give you some examples to hopefully make this easier. Now first, uh, I should back up, first thing, how do I know what numbers are what? Known good value is always the way to go, but I know guys hate that, I hate having to pull another car in. So guess what? I went and looked in TIS, and uh, right here, our knock feedback value, if I look out here, it tells me minus three degrees at 43 miles an hour, and I looked this up for four different vehicles. Every one of them said minus three degrees is what feedback should be. So apparently every time we push the timing until it knocks, we pull three degrees out of it to try and fix it. That's normal. That's normal operation. Not correct is a little more difficult. It can be anywhere five to 28. I looked at a RAV4, it was 18 degrees. Um, the forerunner I'm driving was 26 degrees. I mean, they're, they're timing that seems to make sense, what you would expect to see. Nothing really big, nothing really low. You might have to look at a known good to figure this one out. Okay? So up here on our test vehicle, you can see right now, proper running car. I got three degrees. It's always pulling back to fix that knock. And I'm shooting for about a 24 degree ignition advance. That's a known good value. So let's keep that known good up here. And let's look at an example down here. Now I let the cat out of the bag because you notice all the way out here, what does it say? So I got a lean misfire. We got a pretty big vacuum advance or, or vacuum leak on this thing. And if you guys look down here, my feedback value should be three. I'm having to pull extra timing out of this thing to make it work. Okay, and look at my correct value. Here was the known good, 24, and we're actually at 23, okay? So it's just something you can look at, kind of give you an idea if the, the timing is working correctly. Here's the other big tell, if I can get my finger right. Look at my ignition advance. This thing, customer could be complaining about low power on this thing too, right? Because six, six degrees of timing is way low. We should be up in the teens here. I think they say 16, 18 is, is a good rule of thumb number. So this thing's backing the timing out to try to fix that misfire. Um, and customer may be noticing a lack of power. All right. There's one other thing on here. You can see our data list. I've got my feedback and learn value here. Here's my ignition timing. And all down below, I've got all these idle spark advance controls. Now, these are not going to show up on older stuff. This is probably 16, 2016 and up, you're going to see these. You see over here, idle spark advance, the way this works, we've got individual timing control now we're doing on these cars. This is not a four or six cylinder engine anymore. It's four one cylinder engines and six one cylinder engines when it comes to timing. So if the idle drops, we try to fix that by advancing the timing. All right, so if I'm having trouble figuring out which cylinder to diagnose first, if I look at those idle spark advance, and again, if you guys want to put in the chat or whatever, which cylinder do you think I should look at first? Which one is the computer trying to correct the most on? Anybody want to jump in? Oh, all right. It broke the internet. We're going to figure out how to make that not happen. 
The suspense, the suspense was so so big I had to turn the camera on. Okay. Yeah, five. If we look, if you guys can see, this one has five degrees of advance. The next one is number one's got three degrees, but we definitely are adding a lot more timing to cylinder number five to try to maintain that idle. Um, so it, it's just another thing to maybe help you be able to get your timing in here. Um, none of this is the slam dunk for what's going on, but we can give you a little more information. And I know data list has always been an issue because there's stuff on here that we always ask the question, what the heck does that mean? What the heck is it good for? All right. So that's a quick blast through a bunch of misfire stuff. Like I said, me talking to you guys, just talking about this, I know some of it sinks in. Um, please try and get some time between now and 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Um, I guess we see if we can uh, unmute or whatever. See if you guys um, got an email. Did you guys get an email I sent you with the PowerPoint in it and the worksheet? No. All right, so here's the, um, we got a couple of notes, Scott. All right, so I'm going to pull my low-tech uh, board in here. at toyota.com if you did not get the email send me an email so I know I get the right email to respond to okay send me a quick email I will send you the two files that will also be the email that I will send the invite to for tomorrow's worksheet review and for the next module. Does that, does that make sense? Everybody good? Okay. Anybody got any questions about what I went over, about the whole process? Anybody got anything they... All right. Cool. Weird to see you guys so quiet.